Insurance professionals work hard every day to keep people safe. But as technology transforms the industry, how can insurers protect not only their clients, but also shield themselves from ever-changing cyber risks? My name is Elizabeth Blossfield, and I'm the host of the Insuring Cyber Podcast, a bi-monthly look into how the world of cyber and the business of insurance are connected. Hello, everyone. We're near the end of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and it's been an extra special month because it's the 20th anniversary of October being recognized as a month to raise awareness about the importance of cybersecurity. In honor of the 20th anniversary, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, launched a new campaign called Secure Our World that offers simple steps individuals and businesses, including insurers, can take to keep themselves secure. CISA and the National Cybersecurity Alliance have also partnered to create resources and messaging for organizations to use when they talk with their employees, customers, and memberships about staying safe online. The new Secure Our World program promotes behavioral change across the U.S., with a particular focus on how individuals, families, and small to medium-sized businesses can focus on what CISA identifies as four critical actions. Using strong passwords, turning on multi-factor authentication, recognizing phishing attempts, and updating software regularly. These are all things we've talked about before on this podcast, and our guest this week says these basic everyday steps go a long way in protecting against the most common cyber threats. Our guest this week is Trent Frazier, Deputy Assistant Director in the Stakeholder Engagement Division at CISA. Trent, along with CISA's Assistant Director, leads the organization's strategy to build, promote, and sustain strategic partnerships across industry, public sectors, and institutions, and the international community. He oversees partner coordination and information sharing to support the security and resilience of critical infrastructure against hazards including terrorism, natural disasters, and cyber attacks. He also represents CISA on behalf of the Assistant Director in Engagements with Senior Department Leadership, the Administration, and before Congress. Prior to joining CISA, Trent served as the Executive Director for the Office of Campaigns and Academic Engagement at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. He joined the Insuring Cyber podcast to talk about how the cyber threat landscape has changed over the past 20 years that we've been recognizing Cybersecurity Awareness Month, some of the new initiatives at CISA and how government and industry, including insurers, are continuing to collaborate to raise awareness about the importance of cybersecurity. Check out our conversation. Hey, Chen, it's great to be speaking with you today. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing really well, thanks. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. You know, this is for an episode for Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and I know that this October is a special one because it's the 20th Cybersecurity Awareness Month that's been recognized. Um, And it says on the CISA website that this has grown into sort of a collaborative effort between government and industry to enhance awareness about cybersecurity efforts. So I was wondering how you've seen government and industry collaborating so far and um, what kind of awareness you're looking to grow around cybersecurity. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think you we could say that the the scale of our collaboration has grown to match the complexity of the ecosystem as a whole. I think as we look at the the, the continuing evolution of the digital ecosystem across the country, what we see now is that our digital lives and our and our sort of physical lives are are so intermersed in, interconnected now that that collaboration has to happen at scale across every interaction we have with it, with that digital ecosystem. So we now have collaborative efforts happening real time where we have government and private sector uh, folks working together on actual cyber incidents, sharing information, doing the analysis. JCDC is a great example of that kind of partnership where that real-time collaborative effort is designed to ensure that we're, we're, we're acting on uh, the best information available to us to, to quickly resolve cyber attacks before they can cascade into something serious across our, our networks. We're also, I think, growing collaboration around larger policy concerns. I think one of the more recent initiatives that you, you've probably heard of is our focus around secure by design. Um, and that's a real collaborative effort between industry and government to think about how we're designing the technology products that we employ in the digital ecosystem today. We want to make security um, front and center uh, to ensure that consumers are protected 
from the outset. So, uh, and, and we've seen a lot of engagement with industry partners on how to bring that that vision to fruition. And, and we think Secure by Design will be um, an extraordinary example of, of that kind of collaborative effort. Now, more recently with the launch of Secure Our World, you saw immediate collaboration uh, between both public and private sector partners um, where they we saw the need to bring a more thoughtful and concerted message to the larger public about the importance of cybersecurity and how vital it is for all of us. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, vital, uh, cybersecurity has increasingly become a team sport. Um, and it's no longer the case that government um, or cybersecurity professionals or industry by themselves can tackle the challenges in front of us. This has to be a collective effort. So Secure Our World is sort of the next iteration of that collaboration where we want to ensure that every member of the team understands their part in the larger landscape and how we can work together to secure our networks. Yeah, I love that. Cybersecurity is definitely a team sport, and it sounds like there's a lot more collaboration and partnership going on and a lot of exciting things going on at CISA, too. So I'm excited to dive into that as well. Um, but before we get into that, I know that there have been a lot of developments, as you mentioned, in cyber over the past couple of decades. In what ways has the threat landscape sort of changed in the past 20 years since Cybersecurity Awareness Month began being recognized? And, you know, what kind of changes are you paying attention to right now? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think, I mean, really, you could mirror the, the growth in the ecosystem as a whole with the changes in the threat landscape. I mean, as the digital ecosystem has grown, as it has increasingly become enmeshed in our daily lives, and as it now is so much a part of civil society, the threat landscape has, has grown commiserate to that change. So what we see now um, is that there are just an exponential number of new attack surfaces that are exposed because of that interconnectedness between the digital world and our and our real world and and that we are we're increasingly seeing that that expansion now is not only opening new attack services but it's really opening new avenues for adversaries to use more complex more more um, um, sort of challenging threat threat vectors as they're carrying out those attacks. So it used to be the case that we thought of cybersecurity as a kind of um, a single action where we had a defender and attacker sort of working in the background and the rest of us could kind of ignore what was happening. Increasingly, it is the case now that cybersecurity has to be a fundamental part of our daily lives because it, it is about protecting our engagement on that digital ecosystem. And that's everything from a sort of the, the cloud or the networks that we rely upon all the way down to the individual devices that we're using in our daily lives. It's it's funny, I was I was thinking about this the other day. I, I wear an Apple Watch and 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 rarely pay attention to what it is, but it is another device that has to be protected um, as part of my daily life now. And it's and it's sort of strapped to me. I, I I carry it with me everywhere I go. And that's increasingly the case for all of us, whether it's the vehicles we drive, the phones we use, the computers we rely on, or the technology that underpins most of the infrastructure that we that we expect uh, to to rely on every day. That digital ecosystem has is now so intermeshed with our lives that the attack services are, are are almost exponential. Because of that, you know, we're thinking more more carefully now about how Cybersecurity Awareness Month reflects that that burgeoning audience share, if you will. It, it was at one time solely focused around the general public. We're increasingly focusing around larger and larger audience segments in both the public and government and in industry and the workforce. So that so that every member of that uh, of that community understands the parts that they can play in defending our networks. Yeah, that's great. And it sounds like a lot of great work that you're doing. And I think you're so right. We have so many devices now that are just with us all the time, whether it's our phones or those Apple watches, as you mentioned, a lot more vectors for attacks. And I know, as you mentioned, sort of at the beginning of our conversation in recognition of Cybersecurity Awareness Month this year, um, CISA announced a new cybersecurity awareness program, Secure Our World. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the details of that and why now is the time to launch a program like that. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question. I think one of the reasons that that we've launched Secure Our World as a new campaign is because we've really reached a pivot point um, in the in the expansion of that digital ecosystem, and that pivot point really reflects a transition from a time when what was digital and what was part of our physical lives were sufficiently discrete that we could sort of have separate, uh, keep them separate. 
at a certain point now, they're merging so much that they are becoming part of what we consider our world. And in fact, the our world in that is meant to denote that technology now infuses every aspect of our lives and has to be protected, has to be defended. Um, and, and the secure our world mantra is really about a, a reflection of that team effort, that it is a, incumbent upon on all of us to take the steps to ensure that we're protecting our collective digital ecosystem and the technologies that underpin civil society today. So it, it really reflects our, our acknowledgement that we're making that pivot now um, as a society to a world that is fundamentally underpinned by a digital ecosystem that must be defended. Um, I also think that it represents, a, again, a continuing understanding that we have to begin to start to think about how we're engaging more tailored audience segments across all of our awareness campaigns, whether that's the workforce or government or industry leaders, whether that's product owners or service deliverers or the general public, we have to start to think about creating a mantra and a message that all of us can sort of uh, attach ourselves to and our discrete roles in that larger effort. Yeah, and I love what you're doing with this. And I know um, that sort of leads into my next question as well. You touched on this a little bit earlier, but the announcement about the program says that, as you mentioned, it's encouraging all of us to take actions each day to protect ourselves when we're online or when we're using these connected devices, as you talked about. So do you have anything else to add about some of the small steps each day that consumers can take to protect themselves? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in at the outset of the campaign, we highlighted four basic steps, whether that was employing strong passwords um, or where possible utilizing multi-factor authentication, educating yourself about the signs of a potential phishing attack, or even ensuring that you're regularly updating the software, not just on your computers, but all of your devices. Um, these, are, these are simple steps. They sound really simple, but they actually dramatically improve your security posture, and they really make it challenging um, for, for our adversaries. You know, while adversaries are in, increasingly employing more complex attack vectors, the, the vast majority of attacks today still rely on conventional attack approaches that really are more about the user than they are the device. And in most cases where we have educated users who are taking appropriate steps, they can uh, really reduce a lot of that risk to themselves and to their, to their organizations. Now, in addition, we've also talked uh, at length about protecting all your devices where possible with antivirus software, um, ensuring that you're shopping on safe websites. It, it's sort of almost passe to say it now, but we, we want you to ensure that you, you know the, uh, and understand the websites that you're shopping on and how they're using your information. Uh, that you're looking at the URLs that you're clicking on to make sure that you're not introducing malware, unfortunately, um, by clicking on the wrong uh, links, um, that you're, of course, appropriately utilizing your privacy settings, and that you're remembering to log off your devices um, when, you're, when they're not in use so that they're not exposed on the network. Now, for organizations, we recommend all of the above as a matter of policy within your businesses, within your organizations. But we've also developed some tools that we call the, the baseline performance goals that are really designed to help you assess the posture of your business or your organization as a whole. These goals are highly accessible for businesses and they're really designed to help guide you through a process of understanding where you may have vulnerabilities in your systems or within your networks and the steps you can take to immediately begin to address those vulnerabilities. Abilities. They are not the end of the road, and especially if you're a small or medium-sized business, they are probably not all that you will need to tackle, but they are an excellent place to start and an excellent resource to help you organize your efforts within your organization. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up that framework on your website as well, because that was my next question is about small and medium sized businesses. And the answer might be pretty similar to, you know, the threats that are facing individuals. But what are some of the biggest cyber threats that you're seeing right now for these small and mid sized businesses and how can they be navigated? Yeah, that, that it's a challenging environment for small and medium businesses because in many cases, because they represent such a large share of the U.S. economy, they are oftentimes targeted not just with conventional cyber attacks, but increasingly with ransomware attacks. We see that done by by uh, individual actors, by criminal organizations, and even by nation states who are employing those uh, those those attack vectors as a means of sowing chaos. 
um, within and across our networks. So increasingly, it's important for businesses to take action to protect their networks and to protect their devices. As I mentioned earlier, we very much recommend that owners take action by taking a look at some of the tools and resources that we make available. The, the performance goals are a great example of that. We have other resources available to you on our website. We also have regional offices where you can access one of our cybersecurity advisors who can help walk you through some of those processes. It's also, though, about making the pivot within your organization. It's about creating a culture with security in mind. That means empowering your staff with the tools and knowledge they need to protect themselves and, by extension, to protect your business networks. It also means planning for how your organization will respond if it is attacked. And this is often an overlooked step um, in, a lot of the, in a lot of the conversations that we've heard with small and medium-sized business. It's about anticipating what would happen uh, to your business or to your organization if you are a victim of attack and what you do about that. And having those plans in place is important. It's equally important to exercise those plans. One, so that you, ha you have every member of your team aware of the role that they play during an actual cyber incident, but two, to really evaluate the plan itself. And through that exercise experience, look for any weaknesses in your plan that you need to address before you actually have to turn that process off. During, an, during a real incident. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for small and medium-sized business. Um, a lot of the attacks we're still seeing right now across the board continue to be um, a combination of conventional cybersecurity attacks, um, but also increasingly a share of ransomware attacks. We do anticipate that will evolve as we collectively raise the security posture of our, of our networks and, and devices. Um, but for now, a lot of the work that can be done is, is at the fundamental scale. It can be tackling those, the basics now to really make it harder for adversaries in the future. Yeah, that's all great advice. And that's an important point that you mentioned, anticipating ahead of the cyber threats and sort of trying to prepare as best you can before they happen. Um, so it's great advice for small businesses. And I know we talked at the beginning about increased collaboration between government and industry. And I know that insurers specifically have also been working more closely with the federal government on cybersecurity efforts. So I was curious what some of the benefits have been of this collaboration among insurers and the government. And do you expect that partnership to continue? Um, I mean, short answer, yes. We absolutely expect that collaboration to continue. The, the initial, the real benefit at the outset and over time has been insurers are probably one of the stronger voices for translating cybersecurity into a deeper conversation about how cyber is a part of the financial or health of an organization as a whole. It's important because insurers can oftentimes translate discussions that normally would happen within the IT element of a business um, into conversations actually happening within and across boardrooms. And that, that alone is oftentimes the vehicle for really bringing to bear a lot of deeper conversations about what uh, what industry and government can do to better protect um, business networks and, and users within those networks. I think insurers are also now increasingly a part of the, the government's dialogue about the potential ramifications of large scale cyber attacks, you know, because of their insight into the economy and how um, the results of potential incidents can cascade across the economy. They bring a lot to the conversation about what we should anticipate as we see increasingly interconnected networks, what could happen if those networks were compromised and thus disrupted by by a cybersecurity attack. So I think that collaboration will only continue. We anticipate that the depth of that collaboration will grow and the scale of that collaboration will have to evolve again as we anticipate the evolution um, in the threat landscape itself continuing to evolve. That's great. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see how things evolve in the future. And I know you mentioned as we sort of amp up our response um, in terms of cybersecurity that the threat landscape will likely evolve as well. And I know that nobody has a crystal ball and can predict these things, but just based on what you've seen this year, you know, what are some of the emerging cyber threats that individuals and businesses will need to be sort of keeping an eye on as they go into 2024? Certainly. In the near term, you should absolutely anticipate um, that ransomware attacks and some of the more conventional um, call them low complexity attack vectors will continue to be employed. They continue to be successful 
And so for businesses that, that are, are still working to, to improve the posture of the organizations, you should expect that you will continue to face some of those challenges. As you're raising your posture, one of the things that we now routinely talk to industry partners about is the, is the expectation that we will see increasing use of what you would think of as non-traditional attack vectors. Uh, we recently released uh, a cybersecurity advisory in partnership with, with Microsoft and, and the FBI called Living Off the Land, where we where we saw um, an adversarial nation state actually employing administrative rights that they had gained access to under an otherwise um, normal system and using those administrative rights to, to carry out cyber-related operations. It's a, it, it was a very lengthy intrusion, some, in some instances spanning um, more than a decade, and, and, and the time it took to identify the intrusion and then from that unpack where we saw the, the, the attacker moving across um, various networks was uh, to, um, impressive to say the least. And so we do expect that as we collectively raise the posture of security within and across the United States, that we will see uh, certainly some adversaries raising the posture and the complexity of the attacks that they're employing. So this will be an ongoing um, exchange between defenders and attackers over time. We very much want to see individuals and businesses making it hard for our adversaries. I mean, candidly, uh, a lot of the attacks that are employed today are low skill uh, attack vectors in part because they're cheap and easy to use. Uh, to some extent, they are almost a cottage industry with some criminal organizations um, offering some of those vectors as a service. So the harder we make it for those, the for the attacker, uh, the more we benefit collectively. And we we very much want to anticipate that for the future. Yeah, that's definitely an important point. And CISA has a great framework on its website for individuals as well as businesses to follow to take some of those small steps to make it harder for the attackers. So I would encourage everyone to look there. And thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. This has been a really informative conversation and I've enjoyed it. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, that's it for this episode. And I hope everyone had a safe and secure Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Thanks to Trent for taking the time to speak with me. And thanks to all of you for listening. Once again, my name is Elizabeth Blasfield, and I'm the host of the Insuring Cyber Podcast, a bi-monthly look into how the world of cyber and the business of insurance are connected. Be sure to check back for new episodes publishing every other Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts. Talk to you next time.